Welcome to the International Forum on One Korea. My name is Ye Chin Victor Lee. I'm a senior fellow for Gnosis Asia Peace and Development at the Global Peace Foundation. I'm very honored to serve as the moderator of the opening session of today's forum. This forum is co-convened by the Global Peace Foundation, Blue Banner, and Action for Korea United, and the One Korea Foundation. Under the theme, Free and Unified Korea, Northeast Asia, Regional Collaboration on Denuclearization and Economic Integration. Today's virtual forum is the second convening of the ongoing International Forum on One Korea 2020 virtual forum series that convene prominent scholars, policymakers, and civil society leaders from Korea and the global community to examine key issues, identify new opportunities, and develop collaborative efforts towards a free and unified Korea. Different from the inaugural convening on August 15, today we will have two concurrent Zoom webinars on two important topics of denuclearization and economic integration. This event is also built on the ongoing Wulanbata International Roundtable on Northeast Asia Peaceful Development and the Korean Unification which recognized the unique role of Mongolia in dealing with these issues. While we have many esteemed experts to address these critical topics in these two roundtables, many more people from around the world are participating as observers today. I want to thank all of our organizers, moderators, discussants, and observers for making special efforts to participate in this forum at such challenging time. To start us off, please welcome Mr. James Flame, the International President of Global Peace Foundation in Washington, D.C. Greetings from Washington, D.C. Welcome to the second convening of the International Forum on One Korea 2020 virtual series. The Global Peace Foundation is proud to join with Blue Banner, Action for Korea United, and the One Korea Foundation in organizing this important forum. The first convening of the International Forum on One Korea 2020 was held during Korea's National Liberation Day on August 15. As the series name indicates, the focus of discussions is One Korea, meaning the free and unified Korea that fulfills the aspirations of the Korean people as expressed in the 1919 March 1st independence movement. We are convening an international forum because we recognize both that the process of building the free and unified Korea must be Korean led and that it also requires vital international support. We greatly appreciate all who are participating today. Thank you, Ambassador Angsikan, Dr. Jay Ryu, and Mr. Intek So for your dedicated leadership in this joint effort. I also want to appreciate all the discussants who are contributing their valuable insights and expertise, as well as the participants of these two highly relevant roundtables. Given the current global upheaval and the impasse yet again on the Korean Peninsula, it is certainly time to consider new approaches on both denuclearization and regional economic cooperation in Northeast Asia. Building on the ongoing Ulaanbaatar International Roundtable, today's forum will examine fresh and important ideas, drawing from Mongolia's example and the Northeast Asia Nuclear Weapons-Free Zone proposal. We hope that today's discussions will stimulate new insights and further work that can contribute to the process of advancing a nuclear-free peninsula, along with robust regional economic integration supporting Korean unification. Over the past decade, the Global Peace Foundation and partners have been actively building momentum for Korean-led principled unification with international support based on the Korean Dream Framework. 
as together we build a civil society movement to end the tragic division of the Korean Peninsula. We are motivated by the conviction that a unified Korea that upholds freedom, human rights, and the rule of law is not a distant dream, but an urgent, immediate priority. Again, thank you for participating in this important forum. We look forward to discussions today that are informative and stimulating, and that give impetus to fresh ideas that can contribute to concrete solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Flynn. Now, let's welcome Mr. Intek So, co-president of the Action for Korea United. Hello, everyone. Warm greetings from Seoul. Welcome to this virtual international forum on One Korea. On behalf of Action for Korea United, I sincerely appreciate all of you, not only for your participation, but your constant research and advocacy effort to bring peace and unification to my homeland, Korea. As you know, the unification of Korea is a long cherished dream for all Korean people. Since the tragic division became an agony and wound, ironically, the very pain stimulated the Korean people to walk many more extra miles last 70 years. It made the Koreans to be hardworking people. The people power, the collective effort to make the miracle of Han River out of the ashes of the Korean War. When we overview the situation of the peninsula today, in many aspects, we realize now is the time to move our energy and collective effort to the unification, which is the theme of the today's forum. The Action for Korea United, led by the leadership of Dr. Hyunjin Preston Moon, is making effort in grassroots level to let people know that unification is not a distant dream anymore, but it can become an achievable reality, depending on our effort. We dream the future unified Korea to be a nation upholding the fundamental human rights and freedom, and realize the aspiration of 5,000 years of Korean history. The nation must be a benefit to not only Koreans, but the world of peace and prosperity. I'm glad that we are working together for this goal. So I hope the discussion today contribute for our home, common goal. I wish good ideas and wisdom out of the box, new perspective thinking to be shared today. Once again, Thank you so much for your participation. God bless you. Thank you, Mr. So. Now, let's welcome Dr. J. Poon Liu, founder of the One Korea Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and pleasure to welcome you all to the 2020 International Forum on One Korea. Thank you for your continuing interest in and keeping high hopes for the future of the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia. Now, I will share with you a few opinions I now hold uh, related to the topic of this conference. And uh, I will uh, appreciate it if you would bear in mind in your discussions. My first point is that our search for denuclearization and economic integration should be pursued along with the unification of the Korean Peninsula. Our efforts for denuclearization, peninsula unification, and regional economic integration are not three separate goals, but three interconnected and interdependent facets of the same vision. Second point is that about the type of unification we want for the people of Korea and of the larger region. We strive to help construct one Korea that will be free, democratic, and prosperous. With no doubt, United Korea that may not uphold basic human rights like religious freedom for everyone is not the country we want. People of one united Korea will be governed by the constitution approved in an internationally supervised national plebiscite. No individual, no political party, no group of any persuasion shall be allowed to act above the constitution and the rule of law. Third, 
many recent and ongoing signs are raising questions about the stability or even the very survival of the Kim family regime in North Korea. In all dictatorial power systems, smooth, orderly succession of power is very unlikely or non-existent. Furthermore, KFR is facing these issues amid the ongoing trade and financial sanctions, rapid sequence of natural disasters like typhoons and floods, and regime-made disasters like drought and global harvest, and now the COVID-19 pandemic. Out of these situations may emerge, however, conditions favorable for our kind of unification, like a rise of a collective leadership that could open and reform North Korea to a point to real negotiation with South Korea for the real final unification of the peninsula. Fourth, when and if political instability of KFR becomes apparent and the future direction of that country becomes baffling, we may examine a case for guidance. This is a very important point. Mongolia is a case in point. Mongolia became a communist state in 1924, second only to the former Soviet Union. Mongolia transitioned to democracy in 1990, before the fall of the Berlin Wall or the subsequent collapse of USSR. Mostly Mongolian youth, leading through peaceful demonstration and hunger strikes, forced the communist regime to resign without bloodshed and forced them to move to market economy. North Korea can neither copy nor follow Mongolian model, but we can examine various parts of the Mongolian revolution and use and apply where possible for our use. In closing, I wish to add, one Korea foundation I represent has recently signed an agreement with GPF to co-sponsor this forum for the next three years. In addition to GPF, I'm also very happy to work with my old friends of the Blue Banner and AKU in advancing our shared goals and values. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Finally, let's welcome Ambassador Jay Exkan, Chairman of the Blue Banner NGO in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, and former Mongolian Ambassador to the United Nations. It's a great privilege and honor for Blue Banner to co-host this virtual roundtable together with the Global Peace Foundation, Action for Korea United, and One Korea Foundation. During last year's Ulaanbaatar Roundtable on Northeast Asian Peaceful Development and Korean Reunification, held also on 30 September, as well as this year's August 15th Global Forum on One Korea, it was decided to organize a series of roundtables addressing specific issues that would promote the main objectives. Based on that understanding, the co-hosts have decided to focus on two interconnected issues, establishing a Northeast Asian nuclear weapon-free zone that would include denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and promoting a robust regional economic development and integration. GPAC Northeast Asia, in partnership with Blue Banner, launched in 2015 a track to civil society dialogue process that created political space and venue for civil society organizations of the region, including from the two Koreas and from the US. The objectives include strengthening the role of civil society in building peace and stability in the region and contributing ideas and recommendations to semi-official or official processes. It is within these goals that Blue Banner has been studying with other NGOs the possibility of establishing a Northeast Asian nuclear weapon free zone and promoting economic cooperation. It is always easy to be skeptical, while starting something new needs courage and perseverance. The discussions so far have been encouraging. Hence, the co-hosts have decided to start a process that would go beyond exchanging of information and ideas and move to discussing concrete issues and see if and how these processes could lead to some tangible results. The papers that so far have been contributed are a rich trove of ideas and insights. It is hoped that concrete discussion of issues today would be useful for all participants, including experts, 
former ambassadors, scholars, or those that are following the events on and around the Korean Peninsula with concern and interest. We believe that the proceedings and outcome of this roundtable would benefit not only the Koreans, but the Northeast Asian region as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Engsahan. As I mentioned earlier, today's event is built on the ongoing Ulaanbaatar International Roundtable. The Mongolian team has produced a short video on what we have done there. Please enjoy. Mongolia is a country situated in the heart of Asia. It is a landlocked country bordering Russia and China. It is known as the land of Genghis Khan that built the largest land empire in human history. During the Pax Mongolica, it worked to bring Europe and Asia closer by supporting and ensuring the safety of the Silk Road that connected the two continents and endured peaceful coexistence of different religions. During the Cold War, it was part of the Soviet bloc and in the post-Cold War era, it became part of Northeast Asia. It has a population of 3.2 million and a land almost as large as Western Europe. It has no territorial or border problems with the immediate neighbors. As a relatively small country of the region, it follows the maxim that a duck is calm when the lake is calm. Hence, it pursues an active peaceful foreign policy aimed at bringing the states of Northeast Asia closer together by serving as a bridge between them or as a facilitator or mediator. It works to be not only a consumer of security, but also an active contributor to it. The advantages of Mongolia are that it maintains good neighborly relations with all the countries of the region, including the two Koreas, and has no hidden agenda regarding the Korean Peninsula. It is recognized by the United Nations as a state with unique nuclear weapon free status to which the five nuclear weapon states pledged to respect the status and not to contribute to any act that would violate it. Hence, it has two decades of rich experience of talking and negotiating with the five nuclear weapon states to come to such agreement. In order to contribute to regional confidence and stability, it promotes 1.5 track dialogue among the states known as the Ulaanbaatar Dialogue and brings together representatives of the countries of the region and the United States to consider such soft security issues as economic cooperation, infrastructure development, common ecological challenges, and other issues of mutual concern and interest. GPAC Northeast Asia, in partnership with Mongolian NGO Blue Banner, has launched the Ulaanbaatar process, a track to civil society dialogue process that creates political space and venue for civil society organizations of the region, including the two Koreas. The Mongolian people feel the sufferings of the divided Korean people and supports Korea-led Unified Korea, a proud nation of liberty and prosperity for all. No wonder there are dozens of Mongolian civil society organizations that promote cooperation with the Korean peer organizations. Ulaanbaatar International Roundtable on Northeast Asian Peaceful Development and Korean Reunification was held exactly one year ago on September 30th. It considered such issues as practical strategies for promoting Northeast Asian peaceful development, envisioning a united Korea as a cornerstone for Northeast Asia peace and development, and possible role of Mongolia in promoting confidence and peace process in Northeast Asia. Many positive ideas were flagged and discussed. One idea was to hold an international forum, Free and Unified Korea, Northeast Asia Regional Collaboration on Denuclearization and Economic Integration. This forum is being co-organized by the Global Peace Foundation, Blue Banner, Mongolian Forum for Korean Unification, Action for Korea United and One Korea Foundation. It is to examine how Mongolia's example and the Northeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone proposal could contribute to advancing a nuclear weapon free Korean peninsula with robust regional economic integration. Thanks for the wonderful video. If condition allows, we will restart the ongoing physical Ulaanbaatar International Roundtable in the fall of next year. You are all welcome to join us in Mongolia then. This concludes the opening session. Based on your registration, 
you have been assigned to the round tables of your choice. You do not need to take any action, just need to wait for the moderators and discussants. During the discussion, the audience can ask questions by using the Q&A function of the Zoom webinar system. When not all questions will be addressed during the discussion due to time limits, you will help the organizers and experts to understand the audience and to improve the future events. Please enjoy the discussion. Thank you. Now we turn to round table one. I would like to welcome you all to this uh, meeting entitled Northeast Asian Nuclear Weapon Free Zone and Unified Korea. It is an honor for me to moderate this very important uh, meeting. The organizers believe that with rich discussion, we will be able to start a process of considering issues aimed at promoting the concept of nuclear weapon free zone in Northeast Asia. I'm sure that you have received the guidelines regarding the technical aspects of holding a smooth meeting. Please follow the instructions regarding the unmuting and muting the microphones and keeping to three minute rule for speaking. This would allow us to have about a half an hour for open and very fruitful frank discussion after that. The organizers have received some questions and well wishes for which I would like to thank them. We have 15 speakers. After listening to the presentations, we will have a Q&A session that includes exchanges of views and discussions. Everyone will be muted by default. Those that wish to speak would need to raise your hand so it is visible in your video. When you're called, please unmute to speak and after finishing, uh, sp finish speaking, mute the microphone. The timekeeper will give you two warnings. One, one minute remaining and three minutes that have, has passed. Without further ado, now I call on the first speaker on the list that you have uh, been provided with. Dr. John Endicott is president of Wusong University and vice chancellor of Solbridge International School of Business in Daejeon. You have the floor. May I thank the Global Peace Foundation, the Blue Banner Organization, the Action for Peace United and the One Korea Foundation for being co-conveners for this very significant event. Welcome everyone to a journey that may end with a nuclear weapons free zone for Northeast Asia. Personally, I've been on my journey for almost 30 years. 30, in fact, next year. I do hope you read my short paper that tells the story of how I became involved. Actually, it was the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, of October 1962, of course, next month, 58 years ago. When I was a nuclear weapons planner at the uh, STAC headquarters, uh, as a junior captain in the U.S. Air Force. I saw how close we came to total nuclear warfare. And like others, I believe we came close enough. I was able to act on those thoughts 29 years later in 1991 as a director and professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta. Uh, I did so by advocating the formation of a limited nuclear weapons free zone for Northeast Asia. Uh, my construct included all seven states of Northeast Asia and called for a concept that creates a body to begin the systematic control of nuclear weapons within Northeast Asia and serve as a regional conflict resolution mechanism. Design a supportive infrastructure that involves all states of the region in a cooperative security relationship. Encourage robust regional commercial involvement and CBMs to increase mutual win-win situations throughout Northeast Asia. And finally, ensure that the DPRK specifically has a major incentive 
to be an active and positive member of this organization. From that point on, basically, through meetings in Washington, D.C., Beijing, Atlanta, Buenos Aires, Bordeaux, Moscow, Helsinki, Tokyo, Beijing again, Seoul, Ulaanbaatar, Jeju-do, Shanghai, Tokyo again, Dejan, and Toulouse. We moved forward with the help of advisors from Argentina, Finland, and France, making significant progress in a track two adventure that involved all the governments of the area, including the DPRK, which we met in New York at the United Nations. Ultimately, we came headlong into the legacies of World War II, colonialism, and the Cold War. And by 2010, we really had to admit that it was time to let our ideas age. I believe that now it's time to recognize the concept calling for only South Korea, North Korea, and Japan to be part of a nuclear weapons free zone, uh, because let's call it phase one. Uh, when that's accomplished, we can move on to phase two and involve all the states of Northeast Asia and nuclear arms control. And of course, finally, phase three would be a journey of a free nuclear weapons world. So I welcome colleagues on this journey, a journey for peace, first in Northeast Asia and later the world as a whole. Thank you very much. Oh, I think we uh, were able to hear as I understand, you have a, a proposed a three-phased approach to this issue, starting with the, the two Koreas and Japan, and then going to the second and third stages. I'm sure that those who are participating will have chance to have a, to read your paper, which is very, very important, with, uh, that can uh, provide us with a lot of uh, information on this uh, issue. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Dr. Oh, Tarja Kroll. Um, I'm sorry that technically we didn't make it, but uh, in spirit, we're here. And we're here. Okay, the next speaker is Dr. Tarja Kronberg. She would be speaking about uh, Northeast, uh, North nuclear weapon free zone in the context of European yeah, Union. Sorry. Yes, she represents a CIPRI. Thank you very much. You have the Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, I'm, I'm very glad because I'm having some problems with the, with the network, so I hope this is okay. I would like to say something about the EU positions in, in relation to non-proliferation, nuclear weapon-free zones, and, and also in terms of North Korea. Of course, the EU is not one of the main actors in, in, in the Northeast Asia, and particularly not on the nuclear weapon free zone. The EU has concentrated it, its uh, non-proliferation activities. It has a strategy on non-proliferation. WMD strategy was, was taken 2003. And the EU context has been very much about the NPT universalizing the NPT accepting the Comprehensive Test and Treaty and so that. forth, and, and not very specifically oriented towards nuclear weapon free zones. In, in the Middle East, however, the EU has taken a very active stance, first of all, in, in coordinating the Iran, 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 the Iran nuclear yeah, deals true. negotiations for 12 years, and also in terms of the Middle East, uh, weapons free or mass destruction zone where in 1995 the NPT was made uh, permanent and this was the zone at least uh, progress in the zone was made a condition of, of the permanency of the NPT nuclear non-proliferation treaty. The EU has supported this in 2010 when the nuclear weapon free zone in, in the Middle East was in the in the review conference of the NPT, the EU supported, appointed a facilitator and has actually said in, in many ways that uh, the EU wants to help uh, and do anything it can to, to, to sort of make progress in the Middle East. The One minute remaining. North, Northeast Asia 
has not been a priority. But since the EU has a very positive relation to nuclear weapon-free zones, I cannot see why, if there was a concrete proposal, the <laughs> EU would not support this when it's presenting, whether it's the UN or the NPT or other forums. So I would sort of propose that uh, making this proposal official would get the support, support of the EU. Just a comment, the EU has some sensitivity about the nuclear weapon free zones because there has, during the history, there has been a lot of proposals on EU itself becoming a nuclear weapon free zone. This has not uh, progressed in any other way than on, on sort of sub EU level where some countries have discussed um, cooperation on, on a nuclear weapon free zone. But sort of, I just want to point this sensitivity in the context of the EU and other nuclear yeah, weapon free zones. It raises the requirement also of the EU becoming one. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Kronberg. I'm sure that uh, your experience and you know, especially dealing with uh, uh, nuclear issues will be very, very uh, uh, useful for us. Uh, you have uh, uh, underlined in your paper that if a Northeast nu nuclear weapon zone is uh, put forward officially, then EU would be, would be uh, in principle supporting it. So hopefully we'll be able to get uh, some uh, expert advice from you and from your colleagues uh, once we start the process of discussing this uh, issue. The next speaker on uh, our list is Dr. Robert Gallucci, professor and former dean, Edmund Walsh School of uh, Foreign Service at Georgetown University. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me begin by thanking the organizers for including me in this uh, event. I should confess that while I have worked on Northeast Asian security issues for maybe 30 years, I've never really thought much about nuclear weapons free zones. Um, the situation in um, each zone is special to the regional specifics, but this is certainly true in a, in a very challenging way for Northeast Asia. We are talking about a region that has a nuclear weapons state in it. We're talking about a region in which the United States, from our perspective, we have two treaty allies in the region, and the region is itself contiguous to another nuclear weapons state. This, uh, this reality here presents certain questions uh, or challenges, um, and I've got four here. Uh, first, can a regime be constructed that permits the United States, the Republic of Korea, and Japan to maintain the alliances that connect them, the US with its two allies. And what I'm suggesting here is if the regime cannot be so constructed, the US probably would not be interested in the regime, though I would not speak for its allies. Second, can North Korea truly be denuclearized? This is for Americans very often, as we used to say, the $64,000 question. Uh, by that, we do not mean not nuclear power. We're talking about nuclear weapons. But that does mean all fissile material and probably, unlike other nuclear weapons free zones, will have to bear upon their delivery weapons, the delivery capability for nuclear weapons as well. Third, would North Korea accept negative security assurances common to nuclear weapons free zones as sufficient to guarantee its security against regime change? They have um, frequently pointed to regime change as One the, minute remaining. the reason for their nuclear weapons program. I think the answer is potentially yes, but that is a key question. The fourth question is, uh, will Japan, the Republic of Korea, both of them accept the restrictions on US military and naval operations usually envisioned uh, in, a nuclear, in a nuclear weapons free zone in light of the need to continue to deal with a potential adversary in a nuclear weapon state like China contiguous to the region. Potentially, I think the answers to these questions are in the positive, and we should be looking to make this 
sort of arrangement work, but it will be harder, I think, than other regimes to construct in light of the realities of the region. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Galucci, for your uh, presentation. I uh, believe that uh, uh, your, you believe that uh, the, the issue should be addressed in such a way that it should not uh, endanger uh, alliance commitments, as I understand. And in your paper, you have also underlined that uh, the other issues that should be discussed uh, and considered are definition of uh, denuclearization, possession of visa materials or such material production facilities and so on. So I think it, it gives a, a lot of uh, information that we have to bear in mind if we want uh, to uh, proceed uh, the issue. The next uh, on my list is Ambassador John Everett, former UK ambassador to DPRK. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Um, in view of the problems we've had with sound, I'm going to hold this microphone to my close up close, like a, like a real rock star. I've got a very simple few points. Uh, the single biggest problem with uh, Northeast Asia nuclear weapons free zone has been North Korea's deep addiction to its nuclear weapons program. And I think we might, just, just might, be coming to a change uh, in North Korea's uh, stance, its attitude towards its own nuclear weapons. Let me explain why. The nuclear weapons program started way back in the 1960s, uh, largely for prestige, largely too because Kim Il-sung wanted to, so to speak, hold his end up in the geopolitical triangle between the Soviet Union, uh, China and North Korea. But in the 1990s, the whole thrust of the program changed. It became an instrument of national survival. And in particular, the regime wanted it to solve for them three problems. Firstly, their economic crisis. Uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union and the big changes in the world, they lost their markets, they lost their supply of heavily subsidized oil, and the North Korean economy collapsed, as we all know, Famine ensued. It was a terrible time in North Korea, and the regime was looking for an answer. Secondly, they wanted security. This, remember, was the time of the Gulf War. They had seen what happened uh, to Saddam Hussein, and they were frightened, and they thought that the possession of nuclear weapons would protect them against that. Thirdly, they wanted le regime legitimacy. Uh, up until that point, most North Koreans were told and probably believed that they were living in a paradise on earth, uh, nowhere better under the care of the fatherly leader. But if you have bodies around you in the street, if you're in the middle of a famine, it's very difficult to believe that. And the regime needed a new story, so to speak, to tell its people. They realized One minute that remaining. if they could develop a nuclear weapons program, they could use that to inculcate patriotic pride. And they did so to great effect. For many years, in a bizarre kind of way, and although, of course, all of us recoil from a decision to develop nuclear weapons, from the North Korean point of view, the policy worked. As late as 2012, the North Koreans were trying to extort economic benefits from the Americans in exchange, nominally, for surrendering part of their nuclear program. But time wears on, a diminishing return set in, and the three big challenges that the regime faces now in 2020 are quite different from the ones that spur the nuclear program. Right now, the regime obviously faces the terrible challenge of COVID-19, to which it has no real answer. It faces another economic collapse. The North Korean economy is in a terrible state, Three and uh, the, 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 it cannot really now uh, use its nuclear weapons to uh, to browbeat people uh, into giving aid. And thirdly, the regime has become unstable. We've all watched in astonishment as Kim Jong-un has failed to appear for key meetings. He reappeared in part of the year for some meetings, but not for all. We've watched how his sister suddenly takes center stage and equally suddenly vanishes. 
there's terrible churn amongst these senior leaders and just below the top level. This is not business as usual, something is going wrong. Now, faced with those challenges, the nuclear program makes a lot less sense than it did in the 1990s. You cannot use nuclear weapons against a virus. It's no good at all against COVID-19. It's not at all clear that the regime this time can use the nuclear program uh, to, uh, to, 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 to gain economic benefits unless it's prepared quite seriously to surrender or to trade large parts of it. And Thank if anything, much. the possession of the nuclear program is probably making life more complex at the top of the regime, causing greater rather than less instability. Now, so far, there is no sign at all that the regime is changing its policy. Quite the opposite. They've dug their heels in and they've tried to lock the country down. But it's quite possible, too, that over time, as the challenges that the regime now faces become more and more intense, and the nuclear program becomes less and less relevant, that we will see a major rethink. And that in the perhaps not too distant future, North Korea will decide that the time for its nuclear program has in fact come to an end. It's time to call a halt, time to integrate. And if that happens, then I think the single largest obstacle to a Northeast Asian nuclear weapon free zone will have disappeared. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Everett. I think, uh, as you have pointed out, that it, it needs some change. Uh, the time should be needed, you know, to uh, have the uh, North Korea change its policy, to review its policy, if that is affected. Now, the next next speaker is Mr. Tom King. He he will be uh, speaking. I hope for three minutes because I think we're a little bit running uh, behind the time. Mr. Tom King, you have this floor. Thank you, Chair. Nuclear arms race is on in the region with Russia and the United States modernizing their arsenals while China and North Korea expanding and advancing theirs. A free nuclear, uh, a uh, nuclear free Korean peninsula is uh, crucial to uh, threat reduction and also to non-proliferation. As all denuclearization efforts have failed so far, I think it is worth it to explore the ways of incorporating the structure of nuclear weapon free zone idea into a more comprehensive uh, approach to North Korea. North Korea is a de facto nuclear state and for North Korea to join a Northeast Asia nuclear weapons free zone, they must denuclearize. The benefit of a security assurance from the relevant nuclear state, uh, uh, relevant nuclear states can also be provided by establishment by, uh, of a uh, peace regime, which has been on the agenda for years. Concept of uh, nuclear weapon free zone will also help define the meaning of uh, complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and to clarify the uh, end state of a negotiation. The definition should not only denote uh, to the elimination and absence of nuclear weapons, but also assure the deposition of the remaining nuclear resources, except those uh, for peaceful use. In order to keep off North Korean, uh, keep off uh, US strategic bombers and submarines and aircraft carriers that may carry nuclear weapons further from its territory, North Korean may prefer an extended- uh, One minute has passed. Uh, nuclear free zone on international uh, waters or EEZ uh, beyond the territorial space of uh, two Koreas and Japan. A Northeast Asia nuclear weapon free idea may offer a buffer zone between the China and the United States. China traditionally sought for a buffer against the US encroachment or encirclement. The question is, would the United States accept a accepted as a buffer against China. 
2018 NPR Nuclear Policy Review of the United States Success U.S. Arsenal serves as a deterrence to nuclear and non-nuclear aggression and as an assurance of defeating an aggression if the deterrence fails. The U.S. also believes that three minutes are up. Uh, option of first use of part of their deter deterrence architecture. Now, it is important to continue with Singapore, to continue to build on Singapore Summit Agreement on... Uh, Mr. Tong Kim, I think time is Washington up. Washington and Pyongyang and uh, establishment of a peace regime and uh, complete denuclearization. And uh, the best approach still would be a long-term phase reciprocal action for action and a verifiable process with the conditional lifting of sanctions and snapback measures. There should also be a parallel discussions of a peace regime and normalization. Thank you very much, Mr. Tom King. We're uh, behind time, so I guess I will not try to sum up the, the statement, but that's why I would like to invite the, other, the next speaker, Dr. Anastasia Baranikova, a researcher at, at the Maritime State University. Please try to keep in three minutes. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, let's speak about position of North Korea on nuclear weapons free zone. Uh, in order to understand this position, we should first look at its position on nuclear weapons. The DPRK hasn't yet resumed ICBM test by the moment. However, it doesn't mean that uh, it is ready to abandon its nuclear and missile program. On the contrary, the recent statements and the series of the Central Military Commission meetings presided by Kim Jong-un suggest possible restructuring of strategic nuclear forces and updating doctrinal documents. It may well be that uh, North Korean leadership is just waiting for a convenient moment to resume testing and the international community will soon provide this chance to North Korea. There is little hope of drastic changes in the United States position on North Korea and its news, uh, regardless of the results of presidential elections. If there is no response to North Korean voluntary moratorium, the country may well resume conducting ICBM tests as well. Uh, so the only solution is applying new approaches to the Korean Peninsula nuclear crisis. One of these approaches uh, is establishing nuclear, uh, Northeast Asian nuclear weapon-free zone. This mechanism in its initial format assumes that uh, Nuclear weapon states, uh, China, Russia, and the United States will provide negative security assurances to North Korea, Japan, and uh, South Korea, which in turn will undertake obligations to stay non-nuclear. However, today implementation of this idea in its initial format is impossible, given the current stance and status of North Korea. Since North Korea's nuclear power and this status is a long-term, if not eternal, it should be dealt with as a nuclear power. Prior to any talks about denuclearization, new status of North Korea should be recognized. All talks with this country should be not about its unilateral disarmament, which is unacceptable and impossible demand. More feasible is negotiating a kind of treaty or agreement on limitation of missiles. North Korean status is uh, not the only problem from the point of nuclear weapons free zone. South Korea and Japan cannot be considered non-nuclear states since they have uh, the guarantee of United States nuclear umbrella. Ideally, either uh, Republic of Korea should abandon United States nuclear umbrella guarantees or DPRK should be provided such assurances One minute remaining. Russia or China. The idea of a nuclear weapon free zone could initiate the creation of new regional security mechanism. However, this mechanism implying North Korean participation as a nuclear state seems more realistic. Yes, it would, it would require official recognition of its status. However, it would result in non-aggression guarantees from North Korea to non-nuclear countries. It alone could significantly reduce tensions in the region and risks of further nuclear proliferation. Another point is that nuclear weapon free zone could be more efficient in the format 4 plus 3, nuclear Russia, China, Three minutes North, are up. North Korea, plus non-nuclear South Korea, Japan, and Mongolia. Mongolia uh, declared itself a single state nuclear weapon free zone and its unique status and experience could facilitate creation of bigger nuclear weapon free zone in Northeast Asia. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Anastasia, for your pr presentation. The next speaker is Dr. Kyung Yong Chung of Hanyan University. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Uh, without North Korea denuclearization, we never expect stability and peace on the Korean Peninsula and in the region. Is the North Korean nuclear issue simply one between North Korea and the United States? No. North Korea nuclear warhead is a clear direct threat to South Korean national survival. China, as a key actor and a participant in the Korean War, should join the denuclearization and the peace process on the Korea Peninsula. There are three scenarios related to the North Korea nuclear challenges to cope with any contingency situation. Scenario one, complete denuclearization through the dialogue and negotiation. A true Korea, US, China summit should be held to discuss the North Korea denuclearization issue. These parties need to develop and finalize the framework of denuclearization and any possible sanction deduction and peace regime as an end state. Then we negotiate with North Korea to dismantle Yongbyon a nuclear site as the st first stage. Uh, scenario two, if the international community acknowledges North Korea as a de facto nuclear state, South Korea strategies striking a system against the nuclear warheads should be established as soon as possible. Along with the entry, United States the tactical nuclear warhead to the Korean Peninsula. Scenario three, in the event of the complete breakdown of the denuclearization negotiation, North Korea highly possibility increase nuclear warhead and ICBM. Then, it is inevitable for North South Korea to develop our own nuclear difference in order to achieve our balance. Article 10 of the NPT dictates each party shall have the right to withdraw from the treaty if it decided that the extraordinary events have jeopardized supreme interest of this country. We never exclude this the possibility North Korea attempt to communize the whole peninsula by employing uh, nuclear weapons. If North Korea raises a nuclear war, then South Korea will lose everything, freedom, prosperity, democracy. Naturally, this should be prevented at all costs. Therefore, only option Korea should uh, develop a nuclear warhead along with uh, Japan uh, nuclear development. Uh, North Korea nuclear warhead will be landed useless. Eventually, then there will be no reason for North Korea to detain its nuclear weapon. Subsequently, the Northeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone will come into being. Why not we uh, take that kind of a Time is up. Uh, I would like to. Thank you very much, Let Dr. Chung. Let us choose that path. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chung, for sharing your views, especially the three interesting scenarios in connection with this issue. The next speaker is uh, Professor Singh, who is the Director of Peace Program of Asia Institute. You have the floor, sir. It's my turn? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, Professor Singh. Yeah. Okay, my name is Jin, uh, Dr. Jin Shin from uh, uh, Korea's uh, Chunam National University. In order to remove the threat of North Korean nuclear weapons and uh, also uh, establish some nuclear denuclearized zone in Northeast Asia, it is necessary to offset the effect of the use of nuclear weapons to the possibility of eliminating the effect of the nuclear weapons of North Korea. Uh, North Korea's Kim Jong-un seems unwilling to give up its nuclear weapons. Uh, U.S. President Trump confirmed this through uh, meetings with Kim Jong-un. Uh, so, um, also according to a recent news report, uh, U.S. President Trump is considering a policy that allows South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan 
to develop and process uh, nuclear weapons. As a, uh, another alternative, the development of some uh, kinetic weapons, a uh, conventional weapon system capable of suppressing nuclear weapons has been proposed. So uh, currently, Kim Jong-un regime will not give up its nuclear weapons despite uh, international demands and economic pressures. Uh, so, um, so Seoul authorities should recognize that it is of utmost important for South Korea to prevent North Korea's military provocation by establishing uh, some in the Pacific uh, Security Alliance and also um, as uh, some uh, we have to uh, recognize that a denuclearized zone is a kind of some uh, developmental concept, not the, some uh, fixed concept. Um, notice that countries should introduce uh, some uh, process of pushing denuclearization by uh, creating a Northeast Asian uh, denuclearized zone. This concept of uh, some denuclearization should be recognized as uh, some uh, process rather than uh, some fixed concept. So one minute, one minute. Uh, another proposal is to develop a new weapon system that can offset the effect of new North Korea's use of nuclear weapons. This is one of the some kinetic weapons, a weapon system that can strike within uh, five minutes at the moment of North Koreans launching uh, nuclear weapons from uh, some orbiting Earth or some lower I think the development of such a new uh, conventional uh, weapon system could make North Korea abandon its nuclear weapon by itself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your contribution. Uh, can I uh, invite Professor Singh if he is ready to speak? I believe he's not on, Ambassador. Okay, then uh, we'll uh, move to uh, uh, Dr. Suhao. Dr. Suhao, Distinguished Professor of Diplomacy and Founding Director of Center for Strategic and Peace Studies at China Foreign uh, Affairs University. You have the floor, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador, and thank you, the GPAC, to invite me to attend this uh, webinars international arena or actually uh so my topic uh uh focus on the uh, uh policy base uh for denuclearization in northeast asia because i already submitted a short paper so the time is quite limited i just sum up all my points and then i would like to maybe add one more uh argument in my presentation so first of all, I would say that uh, regarding the backdrop of the strategic situation all over the world, and in particular in Northeast Asia, now we already have the so-called uh, st strategic stability over the world, like the uh, NPT uh, legitimate nuclear power already set a mutual interaction and mutual deterrence so that makes the, you know, the strategic nuclear stability over the world, and also in Northeast Asia. So it is very important, in particular in Northeast Asia, uh, we already have the three nuclear powers, Russia, United States, and China, around the Northeast Asia. So set a triangle nuclear stability, uh, strategic stability, so that we make these regions much more stabilized in a peaceful way to maintain the, any kind of their potential uh, conflict, even their war in Northeast Asia. So I would say that uh, the nuclear strategic stability is very important. Uh, could it be advised by all the members in Northeast Asia? So this is my first point. And the second point I would say that uh, now this will be their policy base for denuclearization for small country and country. Oh, okay. So I would say that in Northeast Asia, now, because we already have the triangle nuclear uh, security stability. So regarding some other 
uh, members like you know, Mongolia, North Korea, South Korea, even Japan. So they were really under the umbrellas of the nuclear you know, st stability. So it's not the wise and the rational choice to be a new nuclear power. So the reason why China do not support any other country, including North Korea, uh, to pursue their nuclear you know, weaponized uh, pursuit. So this is the key concerns of China. Uh, regarding our uh, nuclear uh, policy in Northeast Asia. So uh, now I would like to say, uh, introduce a bit more about the Chinese position on denuclearization. So I already have the paper. I already have the paper, but I would like to just uh, you know, stress the one more point is that China will feel there some kind of security problems minutes, right. from the Northeast Asia. So we do not support North Korea or any other countries to be a new nuclear powers like South Korea and Japan. So this is a crucial point in Chinese nuclear policy. Now I'd like to add one more point regarding their interaction uh, between North and South Korea. From China's side, uh, in particular in my point of view, we are very much optimistic to see the interaction between North and South Korea, in particular in the recent two years. But unfortunately at the moment, this kind of benign and positive interaction, you know, freezing. So it's not a very good signal. So from China side, we do hope our international member states around North East Asia to create friendly environment for North and South Korea and encourages the North and South Korea to engage the more and more interaction among themselves so that they will lay, will lay the foundation not only for the nuclear weapon free zone in North East Asia, but also for the one Korea in the long-term future. From China's side, we do hope optimistically to see the peaceful and the positive and process of reunification of Korean Peninsula. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Suha. I think that the last point was not reflected in your paper, so perhaps you can add it and send it to us so that we will all have time to look at it, the ideas. The next speaker is uh, uh, Kyung Hwan Cho, who is research fellow at INSS. You have the floor. Hi, uh, I'd like to uh, today tell you uh, how to make the uh, North Asia nuclear weapon free zone uh, realistic. Well, as you might all agree, uh, that uh, this concept of North Asia nuclear weapon free zone is still intriguing, uh, but it sounds unfortunately uh, the most unrealistic uh, than ever before. Well, on one hand, the concept faces a tipping point dated back from the time when uh, North Korea declared the completion of state nuclear force on November 29, 2017. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the US ratcheted up a strategic competition against China with a view to excluding China from the US-led international liberal order, which could be an impediment to dealing with the uh, denuclearization of North Korea. But on the other hand, in 2020, uh, Kim Jong-un turned to put more emphasis on uh, security assurances than on the international uh, sanction relief. And the US uh, reiterated stress on uh, multilateralism uh, among allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific uh, benchmarking the NATO system. These could be not only threats, but uh, ironically, uh, also an opportunity to discuss, uh, establish a multilateral security cooperation framework in Northeast Asia on uh, the way to a new platform of Northeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone. Uh, for, for Kim Jong-un, uh, nuclear weapons are indispensable in extracting economic aid from the international uh, community forcing the US and South Korea to change their strategic calculations and having a useful leverage against China. However, the North ostensibly made it clear that each aim of negotiated denuclearization of the Korean One the minute remain. Change and hope to end its hostile relations with US remained. This implied that uh, Kim Jong-un could echo back to his grandfather's suggested policy of uh, nuclear weapon fusion of the peninsula. Then how to make it uh, realistic and revived? Uh, I'd uh, like to uh, suggest to approach establishing the zone 
in the context of a regional security cooperation mechanism or in a dual track pursuing the both. This idea can be realized by a top-down approach holding a regional summit. The entrenched South Korea, Japan, China trilateral summit could be developed into a multilateral venue in a way to invite the others to the annual summit one after another. And hopefully uh, the Korean, the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un first. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Ko Ko uh, Kim Kwan Cho, for uh, speaking within three minutes. I hope that others will also follow your example. The next speaker is Dr. Alicia Campy, adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins University School for Advanced International Studies. You have the floor, madam. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank the Global Peace Foundation, Blue Banner, Action for Korea United and One Korea Foundation for sponsoring this conference today. Um, my topic that was given to me is an impossible topic. Asking, I was asked to reflect on what would be the DPRK's position in looking at the um, nuclear weapon-free zone policy. Uh, as an American, I cannot speak for North Korea. I don't even speak for the United States. So um, I instead, uh, based on my um, uh, experience and research into the Indo-Pacific policy on Northeast Asia by the um, U.S. government, particularly in the Obama and Trump eras, have um, put forth in my paper a number of uh, points or factors that uh, I hope that the North Koreans, as well as other members of this region, would look at the uh, Trump administration's uh, Indo-Pacific policy and perhaps see aspects of this new policy that um, indicate a changing perspective which could possibly be used by Pyongyang to approach Washington decision makers. And um, one of the things that my paper speaks about is that although people have been quite negative in terms of the America First um, policy of the Trump administration, if you look at it, you'll see that the Trump emphasis on a free and open Indo-Pacific relies heavily on new or reinvigorated cooperation structures. But rather than the regional level structures, it particularly likes remaining. to use um, trilateral and quadrilateral, uh, quadrilateral level um, structures. Um, now Pyongyang, uh, when it observes the unraveling of Sino-US relations, which was accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic, is obviously, like many other countries in the region, waiting for the results of the American presidential election. Um, if Joe Biden wins, it might expect American policy towards the DPRK and the nuclear weapon-free zone in Northeast Asia to return to a bipartisan consensus of hostility, which was evidenced during the Obama years, while there was an, uh, an advocating of a new version of Trans-Pacific Partnership. But other aspects of the Trump policy in the region, such as strengthening US ties to India and Vietnam, likely will continue. But if President Trump is elected to a new term, um, I feel that his um, negotiating style, um, which indicates um, finding new coalitions of partners, as he did in the Middle East and Afghanistan, to explore and solve problems will continue. And he is very interested in solving problems that he has not yet finished with, and certainly North Korea is one of them. But I feel that the major um, blockage in our own thinking about the nuclear well, uh, weapon-free zone relates to um, its definition and how it has been incorporated by the United Nations under guidelines from the Nuclear Disarmament Commission, um, which often are 
ignored in reality in the different zones because of the nuclear umbrella concept. And this is something that the Trump administration doesn't like to continue using mechanisms which it feels are only fig leaves and not the reality. So I, my paper suggests that one way forward for North Korea and um, the United States is maybe a discussion of a somewhat decoupling of the nuclear free zone concept from um, United Nations ownership or monitoring. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Campy. We have taken note of your uh, ideas. The next speaker is Dr. Vladimir Ivanov. He's senior uh, associate and director of East-West Institute branch in Moscow. You have this uh, floor. Dear um, conference participants, ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to greet you from Moscow on behalf of the East-West Institute, an international NGO focusing on conflict prevention. In my short remarks, I would like to summarize the major factors defining Russia's interests and constraints in the One Korea Initiative. Fundamentally, Russia is supportive of the idea of a unified, non-nuclear, demilitarized and neutral Korea, except for its dispute with Japan over the South Korea's islands, Russia is not at odds with any player in the region over any historic territories, a marked difference from the situation in Eastern Europe, the Caucasus and Central Asia, whose regions remain fault lines of controversy for Russia, Europe, US and the former Soviet republics. In the context of its worsening conflict with the West, Russia's pivot to Asia becomes more and more imminent, incentivizing the Kremlin to play as much of a positive role in the Asia-Pacific region as possible. Military confrontation on the Korea Peninsula would be particularly detrimental to Russia's economy and ecology. Russia's positive long-term relations with most regional powers, as well as its deep commitment to NPT, make it a potentially strong guarantor of the peace process on the Korean Peninsula. It's important to mention that Russia and China have developed joint policy for denuclearization of, of the peninsula. By the way, today is the 30th anniversary of establishing diplomatic relations between Russia and South Korea, which yesterday was marked by another call by Foreign Minister Lavrov to foster multilateral diplomatic efforts on the peninsula standoff. At the same time, Russia would hardly actively support unification initiatives if it would lead to a breakdown of the, uh, of the current fragile strategic balance in the Pacific, particularly for the benefit of the United States. This conditionality, however, doesn't mean that breakthroughs in unification are impossible. Remember, One minute who, remaining. who would dare to predict in 1986 the fall of the Berlin Wall? and unification of Germany in just a few years. While we witness multiple disruptions in the post-Cold War global order, we may see some progress much earlier than expected and the United, unified Korea eventually emerging through a series of groundbreaking developments. The case of Afghanistan peace process shows that regional policy alignment between US and Russia is not impossible, even against the backdrop of their strategic confrontation. Uh, in my view, the major external conditions for progress in Korea's peace process and denuclearization would, be, uh, would include the following. Progress in a number of critical strategic negotiation tracks between US, Russia, and China, such as post-start nuclear and missile potential uh, control, cyber norms of responsible state behavior, and the US-Chinese trade war. Uh, and an another factor, progress in Russia's territorial dispute resolution with Japan and towards a peace treaty to close, this, to close this confrontational chapter of the Second World War. Let me conclude with a statement that with its strong connections in US, Russia and European Union, the East-West Institute is eager to cooperate with all interested parties in order to advance diplomatic efforts for a unified Korea free from WND and strategic missiles. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ivanov. Uh, next on the list is Dr. Alexander Zhebin, who is Director of Center for Korean Studies at the Institute of Far Eastern Studies at uh, the Russian Academy of Sciences. You have this floor, sir. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you, organizers of this very important, interesting seminar. 
It is impossible to deny that any meaningful steps towards the establishment of nuclear weapons free zone in Northeast Asia should include and maybe start from the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. When that particular issue is, ra is raised, majority of experts prefer to talk mostly about elimination of the North Korean nuclear missile program. Meanwhile, it is highly likely that the scope and degree of denuclearization North Korea will agree to will depend on the reciprocal steps in this sphere in South Korea. One should keep in mind that the joint statement signed by President Trump and Chairman Kim in Singapore calls for denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, not just North Korea only. Why this issue is so important? South Korea hosts more than 28,000 of US troops. Uh, uh, South Korean ports are frequently visited by United States nuclear aircraft carriers and submarines. Her airspace by US strategic bombers carriers of nuclear weapons. Recently, the deployment of American missile defense resumed in South Korea. Last year, United States Defense Secretary Jesper hinted at possible deployment of a new U.S. medium-range missiles in South Korea and Japan. Uh, in addition, South Korea has 25 nuclear reactors operating at, at, at atomic power plants. Seoul is seeking to obtain the right to reprocess United States supplied fuel for its reactors. How will, will denuclearization of the entire Korean Peninsula will be ensured? if this practice continues on the part of the United States and South Korea. Given these circumstances, even in case of the complete elimination of all nuclear programs in North Korea, it will be hardly possible to recognize the Korean Peninsula as having been completely denuclearized. Therefore, it is important how the nuclearization process will proceed and be monitored in not only in North Korea, but also in South Korea. If organization of intrusive inspections at nuclear facilities in North Korea is envisaged, it is highly likely that North Korea side will also want to know what is happening in South Korea to make sure that there is no nuclear weapons there, including at US military bases. It was noted that this issue has been already discussed during the events of first nuclear crisis in, crisis in Korea in 1992-94. Then United States Three side agreed that inspections should be carried out in South Korea. How this issue will be dealt with now, it is a big question that will certainly arise in due time. And uh, of course, nuclear weapons are meaningless without relevant delivery systems. So another topic of future negotiations will be, in my opinion, the problem of curtailing North Korea missile program. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha, for your contribution. The last uh, presenter at this uh, part of the meeting is Dr. J J Jagannath Panda. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Panda, yes. Am I audible? Yes, can we can hear you. Okay, thank you, Chairman, sir. Uh, let me at the outset thank uh, the Global Peace Foundation, Blue Banner, and Action for One Korea for this uh, invitation. Uh, my apology, um, I misread the email, so my paper is for the other session, but I'm speaking for this session. Um, you might find a contradiction between my speech and my paper, but I think I believe we all are talking about the same cause here, that is the unified Korea, the peace and stability in Northeast Asia. Let me share my views, which is an Indian view. How does India look at the current nuclear programs of North Korea? I think there are four specific issues through which we look at the North Korea's nuclear issues or the denuclearization issue. One is that uh, we are not a critical player. India is a non-critical player. Uh, we are a democratic country. We are an aspiring UNSC P5 country, which is aiming to become a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council at some point. 
So we have severe limitations. Therefore, our uh, way of looking at the North Korean nuclear program is really modest and uh, saved by various um, external factors. Uh, therefore, India's views on North Korean nuclear issues is very much cautious and uh, based on its own perception of the regional security issues. Second, we do feel that India, um, North Korea's uh, nuclear issue is not entirely a security problem or a security issue. It is equally also a socio-economic issue. Um, of course, India has a traditional concern with regard to the North Korean nuclear issues. That is North Korea's stronger uh, connections with Pakistan, which we believe still exist, uh, and we, uh, that exist with the with the uh, you know confirmation and acknowledgement of China. But also we do believe that the nuclear process is also key to the region's survivability and the uh, growth of the North Korean economy. So we do feel that North Korea one minute North remaining. Uh, one uh, missile problem of uh, missile program of North Korea is a socio-economic issue. So therefore we do believe that. Um, world should continue to engage with North Korea and we should pursue a dialogue diplomacy in order to get a control over the North Korean nuclear issues. Third, I think uh, UN is still the most effective forum, even though uh, UN sanctions have not really been effective that much on North Korea and North Korea has still uh, decided to pursue the nuclear programs and missile, uh, missile programs. I believe the UN is the ideal platform, platform uh, where we should have a concrete dialogue on North Korea's nuclear programs uh, involving both critical and non-critical players. Equally, the UN-funded associations, NGOs, international NGOs like Global Peace Foundation's Blue Banner Action for One Korea, they should also hold international awareness campaign on the North Korean programs and uh, uh, countries of uh, non-critical nature, including India, should actively participate. My last point is, uh, the regime management is a critical issue in order to get a control Being over the, the nuclear issues of North Korea. And I believe that world should not really, you know, uh, isolate from the Kim Jong-un's regime. We need to engage with the Kim Jong-un's uh, regime. We need to keep continuing with the dialogue and particularly a official contacts with the uh, regime of North Korea. That's key. That's vital for the regional peace and prosperity. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Panda. Uh, with this, we have heard uh, 14 speakers. The 15th person is not here, so I guess we have uh, finished the first part of uh, our meeting. So now we can turn to our second part of the meeting. Uh, having heard the presentation, I would now like to invite you to the second part, the part on questions and answers. Please turn to gallery view so that we can see each other. I would like to say that the session is not limited to question and answers, but is encouraged also to share and exchange views among themselves, among ourselves. In doing so, please understand that time is limited and we may not be able to call on everyone who would speak, or like to speak. We appreciate uh, your understanding on this. Those who wish to speak, please raise your hand so it is visible in the video. Okay, so now I think we can see each other and th this part now we, the floor is open for uh, anyone to ask questions, to make comments and so on. Before doing that, I would like to say that I'm sorry that we had to uh, rush you for three minute time limit, but uh, you see it was, uh, uh, we were encouraged by the overwhelming responses that we have received to participate and to present papers and papers is very important. That's why all of a sudden we found out there were 15 speakers. I'm sorry for, the, for that, for pushing you for two, three minutes uh, limit. Now the floor is open. Perhaps I could ask uh, uh, Mr. David uh, Caprara, one of our organizers. He has been uh, listening very uh, attentively. Perhaps we can start this question and answer session with you. 
David, you have the floor. Thanks, Ambassador. Uh, today, we've been collectively addressing collaboration on a nuclear weapon-free zone and economic integration or a mini Marshall Plan in the context of free and unified Korea. And a key to this is the question, how these parallel issues can be envisioned within such a comprehensive One Korea framework. The International Forum on One Korea in Seoul during the August 15th National Liberation Day recently provided insights uh, echoing GPF Chairman Dr. Hunjin Preston Moon's Korean Dream Book, updated for the centenary of Korea's March 1 Samil independence movement. Unified Korea Framework presents an opportunity to think outside of the denuclearization box to break repeated cycles of failed talks as a standalone. And second, as Dr. Cho Kyung Kwan and Dr. Barnakova's papers noted, such a nuclear weapons free zone process can eventually further a Northeast Asia peace and security mechanism currently non-existent. So one question as suggested in Korean Dream is how this regional process and forum can contribute to a new post-Cold War framework for enduring peace in the region and beyond. And third, building on prior roundtables of GPF, Blue Banner, One Korea Foundation, as well as the UB and Nagasaki processes and the limited nuclear weapons free zone guided by Dr. John Endicott, follow up from today's meeting could include a secretariat to further this collective process to establish an NEA NWFZ within the context of free and unified Korea. And I might add that LNWFZ, the limited zone, was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. We are in good company. So today, we would like to invite all interested scholars and partner institutions to collaborate on a secretariat working group together with Blue Banner and Wusong University, GPF, and the International Advisory Council on Korean Unification. We're pleased to apprise you, Ambassador Inksahan and President Endicott have agreed to co-chair the working group. Kindly inform Ambassador Inksahan or Ye Ching Lee after today's meeting if you would like to participate in this ongoing effort. And last, uh, it's important to determine how civil society leaders can be engaged to foster a wider movement for consensus and to educate a broader range of people, policymakers, and media throughout Northeast Asia and the international community. Action for Korea United provides one good example of the civil movement approach. So GPF and co-conveners will support ongoing roundtables to advance this agenda of free and unified Korea and denuclearization, including quarterly follow-up Zoom meetings and annual convenings, hopefully in person, including the horses uh, in 2021 and 2022 in Mongolia. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, David, for your contribution, for your ideas. The, uh, the floor is open, who would like to speak, follow up on uh, David's uh, ideas or ask questions from the uh, people who have been in uh, speaking very quickly to share their views during three minute time limit. The, the, the floor is open, please. Please indicate uh, your wish to speak by waving your hand. Yes, uh, Dr. Jebin, you have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador. I would like, uh, first of all, to um, extend my greetings to Mr. Endicott, uh, with whom we met uh, 10 years ago in Toulouse, uh, in France, to discuss nuclear-free zone in Northeast Asia. And I am very happy that he again uh, will be leading our efforts in this uh, respect. And uh, my question to him, uh, do you think, Mr. Endicott, that uh, all those um, uh, achievements, results which we achieved under your leadership by 10, 2010 can be to some extent um, used and uh, useful in promoting uh, our current task uh, in a discussion and uh, achieving consensus on a, a work uh, to establish nuclear weapons free zone in Northeast Asia in the current conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Endicott, you have the floor. I'd like to address uh, what Alexander had to say about our many, many meetings that we had. He joined us 
on our last really specific plenary in Toulouse, <coughs> sorry, to, <coughs> Toulouse, France, and that was 2010. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> That's an 85 year old voice. <laughs> Let's start again, if you don't mind. <clears throat> yeah, don't worry, you can start, you can restart. <clears throat> I'd like to address uh, what Alexander had to say. He joined us at the last plenary that we had in 2010 in Toulouse, France. And of course, at that meeting, it was a great meeting where we reviewed <clears throat> through contributions by uh, European specialists, how the Europeans over time had done and dealt with uh, conflict resolution. Uh, the findings were very intriguing and, and useful for us uh, in the long run. Uh, but the problem was in, 19, in 2010, the, the issues that still exist here in, in Northeast Asia that are left over from colonialism and World War II and the Cold War uh, just became uh, so disruptive that we were having a very difficult time coming to consensus among the seven country teams that we had. And therefore we decided to hold it for a while. And uh, I, I think this new construct is appropriate. Uh, many of the things that uh, we had stored in, in uh, last were, were lost, unfortunately in a purging of the computer that was done <laughs> unauthorized uh, here at Wusong. And uh, so we lost a lot of the backup that we had uh, in the year in the early years. But we have really good records from uh, probably, let's say, uh, 2005 or six on. But uh, I think we can be very useful in, in providing that information to uh, the new organization. And uh, let's see if we can't get the same kind of spirit, spirit of conviviality and desire to cooperate and, and see uh, the real victory in coming to a meaningful uh, solution to this nuclear weapons problem. Uh, I personally believe it's the most important issue that we have to deal with as policymakers. And uh, once everybody agrees with that, I don't think there's any problem in, in coming to a solution. Thank you, Alexander, for bringing it up. Yes, uh, Mr. Tong Kim, you have the floor. I just want to make one comment on the topic of unification. As we all know, the incumbent government in Seoul is not talking about unification, nor does North Korean regime other than they were giving lip service and political uh, slogan. Uh, that's the, what uh, they are talking about. I think it's going to take two things. One, the unification of the Korean Peninsula, along with the improved relationship between North and South, two things required for peaceful unification. Now, uh, let me recall the closest uh, discussion between North and South about the unification happened in 2000. Uh, that was a June 2000 when Kim Dae-jung was South Korean government and Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un's father, they met together and Kim Jong-il asked Kim Dae-jung and how many years Kim Dae-jung thought it's gonna take to have a unification if uh, both sides cooperate and going very well. At that time, there was a big agreement the uh, first uh, June uh, 15 uh, summit declaration, and that, which was very historic. And that's the last time they really uh, uh, discussed the issue of unification. Now, Kim Dae-jung's answer was to Kim Jong-il's, it would have taken 10 years in my view. Kim Jong-il said, in my view, it's gonna take at least 40 to 50 years and unification has not happened yet. And if we are talking about peaceful unification, which is stipulated in the South Korean constitution, we have to go for peaceful way and peaceful way meaning engaging North Koreans on this topic. And that has not ha happened since uh, uh, June 2000 so far. So we got to, it's about time to think about how we are going to go about 
unification, what process we will pursue? And uh, that should be a, a real tough question. I think it's going to be a long-term issue. And uh, it's, it's fine. What are great uh, things we can expect and will come from unified Korea. That's fine. And all, all people want unification and freedom and political uh, uh, freedom and, and uh, uh, rule of law and human rights, all that. But how are we going to achieve that? And that's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, was that your question or your position on, on this issue? I didn't quite uh, uh, follow it. Well, question is what other people think about how we go. I'm talking about unification process. It is a process and uh, by step by step, unless we want to resort to, I, I'd exclude the use of force from any application uh, 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 to the cause of unification. And uh, Koreans have uh, fought war each other, killed so many on both sides, and they don't need a second Korean war. So there has to be a peaceful way to bring about unification. My question is what other people might think, how we should go about this. Uh, thank you very much. Would anyone would like to take it up on, on this question? to follow up, share their views, your views on this question of Mr. Tong Skin. I have a question uh, addressed to Mr. Tong Kim. In your paper, you have made reference uh, to extended nuclear weapon free zone. Can you share this view? Is it a new uh, idea or what uh, is it, it based on? It, it, it is uh, based on North Korean fear of uh, American strategic assets, such as strategic bombers, submarines, aircraft carriers, which carry, as we assume they carry most of the time, they carry nuclear uh, weapons as well. And they are just uh, the, the uh, international water. They don't invade the North Korean airspace or water, but nevertheless, close enough to, to wage their strikes uh, very successfully from where they are. So North Korea is very fearful of this uh, maneuvering of a U.S. military force. And I would thought they would, one, uh, keep uh, North uh, American nuclear assets as far away as possible from their territory even not just uh, the airspace and their uh, territorial water, but beyond that, which might be on the uh, uh, EZ zone uh, or partly international water. And uh, I think that uh, could it be possible. And uh, of course, uh, current international law doesn't allow that to happen. But nevertheless, if the parties we're talking about nuclear, recognized nuclear states that could be involved in this uh, idea of uh, nuclear weapon free zone, uh, three countries, China, uh, the United States, and uh, Russia. But North Koreans are more concerned about the U.S. assets, not the Chinese or Russians. But therefore, if United States agrees, okay, we're gonna stay away from your area and uh, make sure you are completely denuclearized and you're not going to uh, invade or, or attack the South, our ally and so forth, then we will stay away. But if you do not keep your word, just like uh, they can put back, snap back sanctions again, if North Korea fails to carry out their commitment, they might have some conditional agreement. I mean, they, meaning the United States, is that uh, uh, if you... Uh, uh, do all the things you said you would do it, and there will be verification mechanism that will go along with the nuclear weapon free zone structure as well. And it, it's going to be constantly implementation uh, of a verification. And on that idea, I think the U.S. could uh, stay away 
uh, not entirely, not all the international wars, but especially on uh, what the South Koreans are report to as the East Sea and Japan, Sea of Japan, and some of the area. That, that was my idea. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, Mr. Kim Chung. Yes. Uh, may I ask a question? Yeah. Okay. As I presented earlier, the, the prospectus uh, for the denuclearization of North Korea looks like gloomy. Considering the reinforcement of nuclear capability in the past uh, several years, we assume that already they produced more than uh, 32 warhead, nuclear warheads. Uh, it highly likely North Korea will never abandon a nuclear desire. Then what should we do? It, that's why I propose inevitably, and also uh, Northern uh, Triangle, including uh, North Korea, Russia, China, but it's nuclear state. But in the meantime, certain parts, South Korea, Japan, but the uh, United States far away from uh, North East Asia. The extended difference or nuclear umbrella, it doesn't work at all, considering this situation. Uh, that it is inevitable for South Korea, Japan, to develop the nuclear warhead to ensure the mutual assurance of destruction. This, this is inevitable. Uh, what the uh, Chinese or Russia uh, position related to the, our uh, nuclear development? Uh, thank you very much. Perhaps uh, we can uh, turn uh, to Dr. Suhao. Uh, whether he can uh, try to answer the question from the Chinese perspective. Unmute your, uh, please unmute. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the questions. I actually, uh, I'm not a very much clear answer to uh, my, my dear friends, uh, uh, Dr. Kyung Yong. Hi, and nice to meet you here. And uh, see you. Well, uh, actually, as my point in my presentation, I would say that China uh, will feel also uh, some kind of threat from the uh, nuclear pursuit uh, taken by North Korea. So uh, the reason why China take joint efforts in the international community, including in particular China and the South Korea, all together uh, to try to offer some kind of economic uh, you know, assistant to North Korea, so make them as some kind of new option for their, their national, their, you know, people's development, and also the latest economic foundation for North Korea, so that they can have more confidence managing their own uh, state uh, in over the North Korea. That would say that China and South Korea will share the common ground plus other international community. But I also have the one question uh, to our Korean participants or maybe American uh, participants. This afternoon, I uh, have a meeting with the senior diplomats from the South Korea embassy in, in China, uh, to China in Beijing. And so we shared uh, some kind of common ground that Recently, you know, the freezing of their interaction between North and South Korea, that's real some, you know, some impact from the United States. It seemed to me, to us, that the United States or uh, President Donald Trump's not very much optimistic to see the interaction between North and South Korea. So, American side is not very much encourageable to the South Korea to have the uh, you know, uh, capacity to engage into the North Korea by means of assistance. 
So my question is to our, our American friends, or maybe it's their South Korean friends, that is that true or any particular Americans thinking way, you know, to manage their North and South Korea interacting issue? So this is my question. Thank you. Well, you're asking a question in replying to uh, somebody else's question. Well, I would like to uh, ask who would like to speak. Uh, well, I think we have very limited time for in one or two minutes, if you can respond from the U.S. point of view, or even we, we also uh, can invite Dr. Jebin to uh, respond to the previous question. It's up to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Alicia? I see yeah. your hand. Alicia. You know that Russian policy that a nuclear weapon states, official nuclear weapon states should keep their nuclear weapon uh, within their borders. All other options are clearly violation of nuclear non-proliferation treaty. And uh, the same practice which employed by the uh, United States in Europe when they uh, allow uh, local pilots uh, to be trained in using nuclear weapon, and the same maybe in some other countries are clearly clearly violation of nuclear uh, non-proliferation treaty. So I think that um, we should uh, uh, start from the uh, restriction of activity of official nuclear weapon states in um, areas which are uh, maybe thousand miles from their borders and. Uh, uh, I don't think that extended uh, deterrence should include presence of American troops in South Korea. Uh, modern uh, ICBMs can reach uh, necessary targets, for example, in North Korea, in 30 minutes. So uh, direct deployment of uh, uh, foreign troops or uh, any country troops uh, near the possible uh, adversary is not necessary under the modern technologies. Uh, so uh, uh, if North Korea feels uh, that direct placement or deployment of uh, American troops is really threatened uh, uh, its existence, I don't see, think that there is a big problem for United States to drastically cut or even withdraw it's for forces from the south of the peninsula. Thank I you very much. Under current conditions, North Korea, even if it will remain um, partly nuclear power, will dare to attack South Korea. And uh, um, uh, North Koreans will know for sure that the United States uh, can uh, and should, will, will retaliate by their uh, precision make uh, weaponry, even if it weaponry will be used from the uh, United States continental part. Thank so you, Alexander. This problem, big problem in, in, in um, addressing both worries of South Korea, uh, worries of North Korea, and uh, the ability of United States to deter any possible aggression uh, against South Korea. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, Dr. Kempi? Um, the main part of um, some of the questions is a question of process of negotiations. And what my paper tried to say and outline more specifically by looking at the Trump way of doing negotiations in the Middle East and Afghanistan is to reject the concept that the Trump administration does everything bilaterally. In fact, it does a lot of trilateral, quadrilateral, and groupings that are not official, but it uses, for example, in the Israeli um, peace agreement that just came forward, it uses um, different types of nations in different configurations than in the past. So I believe that if you have a Trump administration continuing for a second term, that because of the personality of the president, 
he sees the uh, North Korean issue as unfinished business. President Trump does not like unfinished business. And he can continue to revive processes outside the limelight of the media and make progress and then suddenly come forth with another step in the process. So what is the process? The process is not the withdrawal of troops, not the um, removing of ICBM uh, uh, missiles, maybe not even necessarily um, North Korea making a promise to denuclearize. The first step in the process is to get a peace between North and South Korea that officially ends the Korean War. Now, that kind of first step, which has lots of ramifications in all these other issues, is something that could be dramatic and yet be oh, something you. that uh, people can feel they can attain on all sides and all sides, big powers and small, both Koreas would claim a victory. So this is the kind of thing I'm predicting for a second Trump administration. Thank you, Alicia. I think we have time for one or two uh, persons to briefly uh, comment on those issues. I would like to uh, 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 invite uh, Ambassador Everard, who has raised his uh, hand. You have this closer. Thank you. Briefly, as you say, we're short of time. Um, Sasha Jabin, who I think has now left us, uh, suggested that there was no need for US troops uh, in South Korea because the US can actually hit North Korean targets remotely. That, of course, is true, but the troops are a vital element in deterring North Korean aggression. Uh, firstly, they mean that very quickly after any North Korean attack, North Koreans will find themselves fighting Americans, which is psychologically important, if nothing else. Secondly, they give uh, those who wish to uh, combat North Korean aggression a much greater range of military options. You don't probably need uh, to go straight to missile strikes. You can actually engage in infantry warfare against a North Korean attack. Those troops should stay. Um, Alicia, uh, I, I do understand what you're saying about the need for a peace treaty between North and South Korea. Can we please remember the war wasn't between North and South Korea. The war was between North Korea and the United Nations. And if there is a peace deal, then please, we all get a say in this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if there is if there isn't anyone else who would like to speak, I guess we will, uh, we're coming to the end of this meeting. I think we started the very interesting uh, issues. We started, but I guess uh, because of time limit, we are not able to uh, uh, continue this. But I would like to say that as organizers, we have a wealth of uh, uh, papers, many interesting ideas, which unfortunately, because of the three uh, minute time limit, we were not able to discuss. But I'm sure that we will make use of those ideas. And next time when we meet, we will uh, continue uh, on this uh, issue. Now uh, the time is uh, limited, so I would like to ask uh, Mr. James Flynn to say a few words. Thank you very much. James. Thank you, Ambassador. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, for your contributions to this important discussion. And as uh, the Ambassador just mentioned, uh, these are very, very important issues. Uh, many of you have pointed to the fact that, that uh, the, the complicated dynamics uh, in Northeast Asia and on the peninsula uh, have been worked on for decades, but circumstances can change dramatically and, and quickly. Uh, and so these kind of discussions we consider extremely important. Especially appreciate the, the commitment from, from many of you to, to continue to work on these issues with the working group that has, has been uh, discussed here. And we look forward to the uh, important uh, work of that group and, and the, the important ideas that can have practical application in the process going forward. So again, thank you very much for all your contributions and thanks to everyone who uh, uh, observed and joined and participated in this forum. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, closing remarks. I would like to say that again, that uh, I don't think next time we will be using a three-minute time limit. It should be at least five to seven minutes. Uh, 
even if there will be again overwhelming interest we i think we will have to uh, limit the, the 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 number of speakers otherwise you know we were uh, very much uh, driven by the number of uh, responses there i would like to say that uh, having received all the papers i had the time to look uh, over the papers and there are so so many interesting ideas that we can discuss or follow up and so on. So uh, when we have a working group, I'm sure that we will go through these ideas and come up with some uh, uh, pr proposals perhaps, and then we will let you know. With this, I would like to thank you once again for participating in this uh, unusual uh, meeting. I hope that uh, uh, you, when you read the papers, you will know that there are so many ideas and we will, shall start the process of discussing the ideas and following and following on these issues. Thank you very much for your uh, participation. I would like to thank the organizers for this uh, and uh, I hope that we will continue meeting or at least corresponding uh, with each other to uh, push further these ideas. Thank you very much and have a nice day or a nice evening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.